to help somebody else make it across. Thank you, Jesus. Don't pull up the ladder because you climbed to the top. Don't blow up the bridge because you made your way across. Thank you, Jesus. But reach your hand back down the ladder and pull somebody else up out of Lodabar. WTCC, good morning, welcome to the Black Love Experience, Bishop Talbot Swan II, um, here with you and another edition, shout out to Representative Ben Swan, um, and to each and every one of you that are listening throughout the Pioneer Valley, uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Vermont, wherever you are in the valley, good morning to you. Anybody listening on the World Wide Web, anybody listening through the iHeartRadio or through the WTCC app, all of y'all, welcomes, 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 welcomes uh, to the Black Love Experience. Continuing the conversation from Monday, talking about um, the attack on black history. We'll have a short State House update um, at 930 with Representative Bud Williams. Um, and we'll get y'all in the Twitter space and wherever else you might be chiming in from. I got to take off my sweatshirt because it's hot in this studio, man. Whoo, good Lord. Uh, it's getting hot in here. Okay, y'all gonna think I ain't saved, so let me not let me not do that. Four one three seven three six two seven eight one is the number here. Tell a friend, tell somebody that Bishop is on the air right now. All right, rep your city, rep your town. Um, like, share, subscribe. All of that stuff. Um, listen, listen. This coming Thursday, we kick off with Dr. Keith Motley. We're kicking off our annual 
13th annual Lift Every Voice Lecture Series. So you want to be in the house. You want to be a part of that. It's happening at the Spring of Hope Church of God in Christ, 35 Alden Street, Springfield, Massachusetts. The Brick Church right there at Six Corners. Keith Motley is, is this coming Thursday. Dr. Wes Bellamy is the week after that. Coming in on March 9th, the one, the only, Teslin Figaro. And we're kicking it off with Springfield's own author, actress, entrepreneur, went to school right here. Okay, high school, went to AIC. Uh, Vicki Irvin uh, will be in the house on April 12th. So listen, it's going to be a dynamic series. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Don't go nowhere. Tell somebody Bishop is on the air. I'm going to take this sweatshirt off. We're going to get into our conversation, okay? I'm going to be a lot cooler when we come back after this short break. <laughs> All right. Stay with us. Don't y'all go nowhere. We'll be right back. In the mirror, and I like what I see. A strong, beautiful black woman staring back at me. One who's seen a lot of pain and had her share of sorrow, but who never gave up hope for a brighter tomorrow. I've been lied to, cheated on, stolen from, and hit. But it just made me stronger, and I refuse to quit. That's right. And though I've been tempted, I refuse to stoop to their level. Don't go down. I was above that nonsense and made a liar of the devil. All right now. The devil who said I wasn't good enough, cheap enough, or worthy of love. I kicked his butt with divine power from above. Power that says I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And brought me out of darkness so that I could see that I'm smart. I'm beautiful, I'm a child of the king. Abundant love for me, he came to bring. Oh yes, when I look in the mirror, I love what I see. That strong, beautiful black woman, that woman is me. Ninety point seven WTC. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning to each and every one of you that are here listening with us on today. Um, uh, we started out a conversation on Monday, um, and we were talking about the well, basically the erasure, because that, cause that's really... What, what is happening there, there, there is an attempt to erase black history just get rid of it. We, it anything that has to do with black people anything that honestly assesses the way they have been treated in these yet to be United States of America H-Town is in the house. Where are my Springfield folks? Where are my Springfield, Massachusetts folks? Y'all need to rep, 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 rep your city, rep your town. Um, um, they, they, they're, they're, they're basically trying to erase it. Get rid of us. We don't want to talk about it. Um, we, we don't want to even deal with the reality that America has mistreated black folks. That that we owe black people anything we don't owe y'all an apology we don't owe y'all no reparations we don't even y'all and acknowledge that um american chattel slavery ever happened that jim crow ever happened that lynching ever happened um you know that the brutalization dehumanization of black people ever happened that redlining ever happened that stereotyping ever happened that discriminatory practices have ever happened that segregation has ever happened we, we, with that mass incarceration has ever we, we don't want to talk about none of that we don't we don't, we don't want to deal with any of that and we don't really care that it's black history month okay 
that's y'all thing. We 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 don't care about any of that. Um, we just want y'all to leave us alone. Stop making us feel guilty because we're white. And 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 that's really what they have reduced. They have reduced black history down to uh, a reality that makes white folks feel bad. And so they're passing laws that literally have the, 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 the language. The Florida law, the, the Stop Woke Act, literally has the language in it that if it makes white children or white people feel anguish. Anguish! Let, let, let me look this thing up, man, because um, I want to give you the proper language. Um, if it makes them feel anguish, now, now just think about that for a minute. Think about that for a minute. Black folks had to literally feel anguish. Um, um, because of physical acts that were actually done to them, because of uh, the the trauma of of real things that happened to them, um, white folks are saying we don't want to feel anguish from hearing about it. it just think about that for a minute. Y'all had to feel anguish from experiencing it. Let, 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 let's define the word. Anguish. Severe mental or physical pain or suffering. Severe mental or physical pain or suffering. Okay? That's what anguish means. So white folks are saying they feel the same severe pain from hearing about what they did that black people feel about actually experiencing it. This, this is insane. This is insane. It, 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 the Florida law Okay, deems it discrimination. Listen to this. If a student was exposed to anything that compelled them to believe he or she must feel guilt or anguish. Guilt or anguish. This this is literally, this is literally what these folks have passed. This is what they passed, y'all. We don't want to feel guilty or we don't want to feel anguish. We don't, it's painful for us to have to hear that our four parents were mean to y'all. And so we're going to make it illegal to tell us the, the truth. Good morning. How are you, my brother? I'm good. That word anguish actually has two different definitions. There's one definition as a noun, and then there's another definition as a verb, which I really found interesting. I never understood that. You could have one word with two different meanings, whether it's used as a noun or a verb. So I'm going to do a little more research on there, but I just thought I'd throw, throw that out. All right, appreciate you. 413-736-2781. Yeah, it 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 is it is illegal if white folks feel anguish. For you to talk about anything that makes them feel anguish. So if we tell you about our four parents being whipped and lynched and bloodied and bruised and raped and um, tarred and feathered and burned and um, held in 
in, in enslavement for their whole natural lives and then uh, even after uh, slavery was abolished the type of physical um, and mental terror that black people went through y'all tell us forget about it but for, for y'all to hear about it makes you feel anguish severe pain Oh my goodness. Severe pain. HBK. You're in the Twitter space. Holla at you, man. What's on your mind? Good morning, Bishop. Good morning. Good morning, family. I, it, it's coincidental that you having this uh, discussion or this topic right now because I've, I've been doing several spaces over the last week uh, with a certain group of people and majority black and um we get into some deep discussion about you know black history america in america and it seemed like the fellas would agree uh they're not really knowledgeable in a lot of stuff so i basically had the floor but then it's a wrestling space but then when a white folk when white folk come in uh they want to try to change their tone and they want to, you know, try to change the subject to change what we're talking about uh, because it makes their fan base uncomfortable. This this wasn't my space, it was theirs. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because last night I did one and it was a white guy that came on. And he was talking about how he grew up predominantly poor and how, you know, uh, if he go to a certain town, I guess he was from Alabama. If he go to a certain town that's supposedly sundown for him, he was basically saying that he grew up in his terms, the ghetto, uh, referring that he grew up around a lot of black people as if that was supposed to mean something, mm -hmm. which is a problem within itself, obviously, um, if you look at it like that. And um, this guy, he wanted us to fit. He, and I mean, the black guys that were in there, they completely turned and was starting to feel sorry for him talking about that is an issue that we need to address rich versus poor my point is this we need to stop we care so much about other people problems that we neglect our own mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's got to stop within itself we got to stop feeling sorry for and we got to stop and we got to stop being so concerned about hurting their feelings with the truth you know i mean we, we've got to experience the truth of white supremacy every single day i mean i just went through just literally just this week just just on tuesday you know white women assembling like voltron at starbucks um against me um uh, uh, where this one white woman lied and said i was trying to take a picture of her she was ugly to begin with um number two i'm not into white women i got a beautiful black wife we celebrated 32 years of marriage uh just yesterday and and um, um, the one at the counter, uh, the, then she accused me of following her. I'm like, how did I follow you when I was here before you got here? And this lady at the counter knew I was there before she got there. Then the manager comes out and threatens that she's going to call security. So three white women assembled like Voltron, you know, against a brother. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff that gets black men killed. And we have to deal with that foolishness every single day of our lives and, 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 and but then but then we're going to sit around here tiptoeing through the tulips worried about their feelings if we tell the truth about it and my thing is and you know a lot of people say it wasn't us it's not us it's, it, it was our ancestors and we need to move on but then again once again a lot of people a lot of black people deal with that type of mess in this country right here in 2023 mm -hmm. my thing is this if the, I always ask two very specific questions at what year did the majority of the whites stop becoming racist collectively as a people towards black people, mm -hmm. uh, black Americans uh, specifically? And also, if they are so much not, if the majority of the whites are not racist, why aren't they doing? Why aren't, aren't they doing the best that they can collectively as a people to destroy the system of white supremacy? Yeah. Because it still benefits them. Because it benefits them. Exactly. And so they're 
whites are very deceitful. So they will be friendly. They will tell your children, their children to, you know, be friendly with, you know, such and such, such and such. Uh, See, white, uh, folk, white folks' definition, definition, white folks' definition of not being racist is, I don't call you nigger. You know, I don't. You know, I I don't say mean things to you and stuff like that. But if mm -hmm. but if I sit idly by and benefit from a white supremacist system and do nothing to dismantle it from disenfranchising you and privileging me, then you're still racist, whether you believe it or not. White folk are not going to sit up here and be openly racist. I was talking about. Um, I don't know if you're in the wrestling, but I'm pretty sure you know the name Hulk Hogan, right? Mm -hmm. Hulk Hogan. Um, 20 years after his career was definitely over he made he made all the money that he could it was a tape exposing him of saying the word nigger 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 and um, uh, because his daughter was sleeping with a black man and he was upset about it well if hulk hogan had to came out being openly you know true expressing his true feelings 30 years ago when he was on top he wouldn't be hulk hogan today mm -hmm. so it shouldn't surprise you that technically all white folk are racist and we have a you know we don't and nobody on this earth have much time to live technically so we don't have time to investigate who's racist and who's not well I, I i put it like this i put it like this dr king said this and this is the quote they they won't ever quote from mlk mlk mm -hmm. said i'm sorry to have to say that the majority of white americans are racist either consciously or unconsciously that's a direct Dr. King quote. That's the Dr. King they don't want y'all to know about. And that, and he was speaking absolute truth. And they killed him immediately. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. 413-736-2781. M1. You are in the hizzy. You are in the house. You got the microphone. Um, Unmute your microphone. Holler at your boy. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, Bishop. How you doing? Good afternoon, Bishop. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. I yeah. I just I just I want to say this. Yeah, I'm a racist, but oh, can you hear me, bit? I can hear you, but you you're breaking up a little bit. Go ahead. We hear you, brother. Speak your peace. Okay, he's having some technical difficulties, so maybe we'll get him back in uh, the space. Put another request in. Uh, 413-736-2781. We're talking about um, the hijacking of black history. Um, um I'm going to go to the phone line momentarily, get our state house update. Let me see if I can get M1 back in. M1, you're back, you're back, you're back in the, you're back in the space. Uh, you got the microphone. Nope, he's still having trouble. All right, man, we're going we're gonna to have to get back to you um, momentarily. All right. Good morning. Good morning, Bishop. How you doing? This is uh, State Rep Bud Williams. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'd just like to give you a uh, summation of the State House report as hope that we continue into the new year that we uh, get back on track. All right. Kind of, I've been off beat a little bit. A couple good things going on. First of all, um, a great sermon on Sunday. And uh, I want to I wanna commend you. Uh, for your work you've done nationally in the Nichols case, Tyree Nichols case, along with Reverend Al Sharpton. Thank you, sir. In terms of, in terms of bringing justice to uh, to the Nichols family, uh, you made us very proud, uh, uh, well spoken, and uh, just so happy. And I did text you, text you a nice message last week. But thank you for what you're doing locally and nationally. Very important. Very important. With that being said, I just been uh, elected. Uh, uh, chairman of the Black Latino Caucus. Congratulations. Thank you for the next couple of years. And we're going to bring back our Black Excellent Award Program, which you have participated in. Uh, we're trying to do it within the next couple of weeks. It, it might end up being a virtual uh, celebration. Uh, and I'm going to be looking for your help. Uh, I'm going to ask you to, if you're available, it'll be the probably the 28th 
uh, to bring the keynote, probably virtual, because we, we're trying to put it together, but it's, uh, it's been a little difficult. So uh, keep that date open. I can let you know really by later today. Uh, I'm going to need you. You know, we did the virtual last year, and we had probably uh, 500 viewers. We did the, in, in the evening, and the award winners last year, from uh, my perspective, was uh, Reverend Morgan and Lucille Kennedy. So I just wanted to thank you for the work you continue to do. On the on the uh, front, uh, tomorrow, Saturday at 12 o'clock, there's a meeting in Mason Square Library to talk about uh, Mason Square Community uh, sidewalk program, uh, 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 facade grant program, a lights program. So people, please show up tomorrow so you can have input. There's a lot of money, Bishop, uh, going through Mason Square, from the TDI program to the, to the city, to the state. And on uh, yesterday, we just awarded Sprinkland Neighborhood Housing Services $125,000. And the funds that uh, they'll be using is for branding, storytelling. That was from the state? Yeah, yeah, that's from the state. Uh, came from mass development. So uh, you know, part of that TDI, all that money is through TDI, through the state. That's the state. Uh, so we're, we're looking to, uh, you know, and uh, your church, your part of, are you, in, are you in historical, is that just a historical where you are? As far as I know it is, yes. Right, yeah, that's, that's what I thought. We need to have a, I need to talk to you this week because there's some, uh, there's some things going on with the historical, with the historical community. So uh, we're going to continue to uh, pump in, hopefully, thousands and thousands of dollars to uh, revitalize that uh, Mason Square area, which I consider from six corners all the way up to, to Mass Mutual, basically. So uh, I know you're interested in some, some property over there, so we're going to try to make a lot of things happen uh, this cycle. So hopefully uh, Jeff and uh, Leo Williams will uh, you know get the word out and uh, get folks involved. And uh, the TDI, which... Uh, they're going to reach out to you, my aide, uh, Daryl Williams, is working very close with them. And we were just up in Mason Square uh, about a couple of weeks ago, and we're trying to revitalize that block. One of Ben's offices. That's yes, sir. Where, uh, uh, Uncle Ben's office, um, Panage, uh, the laundromat, uh, and then you have the, uh, the jewelry shop, and then the, uh, the Jamaican Social Club is there, too, right on the corner. So... Uh, and the school is coming along beautiful, the Ben Swan Elementary School. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll continue to, to work hard. On the legislation front, and I'm going to be really leaning on you, I filed some very uh, interesting bills. And one of them, and you can comment on it as you, as you see fit, Bishop, one of them is the an act uh, relative to missing black women and girls in Massachusetts. Uh, some advocates... Uh, some black ad women advocates up in uh, up in uh, Boston reached out to me. There's really no there's no reporting when when black uh, women go missing. I mean, there's no mechanism. It's just like uh, sometimes they don't treat them as uh, as missing folks. They just treat them as runaways. And we know that we don't have any vehicle to get information to track. And uh, black women are more more likely to be uh, you know. Not 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 only those that are missing, but those that are victims of crimes, those that are, are murdered, uh, oftentimes their their cases get closed very quickly. Um, um, matter of fact, we we have a monument down by the courthouse of black women that were murdered here in the city um, whose cases were closed. And after we raised the, the issue and placed that monument um, we had some of those cases open back up and four of them eventually got solved. So they're very quick to shut the door on dealing with issues around black women. Okay, that's, that's, uh, that's great. And I'm, and I'm taking notes as you talk because we, what, what the legislation is, we're still drafted it. So uh, they call it, it's in a placeholder. So in other words, we're working on it. So anything you think we should be, it should be added to this legislation. I'll be reaching out to you. We can incorporate in it. 
because you're absolutely right. It's just, it's just, uh, it's just, uh, it's just something that needs to be talked about and needs to be looked at. And hopefully, we'll be able to uh, to do this, and then we'll get some some closure on that. Uh, also, we uh, filed another some legislation with uh, Tram Nugent, uh, and I think you were part. Of, weren't you part of the hate crime uh, committee? Yeah, I'm on the hate crimes task force. We had uh, we filed with uh, Tram Nugent. She's out of the uh, 18th and 18th district. We filed an act to, uh, to reform the hate crime statutes because, as the as uh, the hate crime statutes in, in, in Commonwealth of Massachusetts, very hard to prove. The bar is so high, and a lot of police officers, you ask them to invest to invest a case, uh, and they'll say, "Well, that's not a hate crime." Well, how do you know it's not a hate crime if you don't investigate it? And what comes to mind to me is uh, the the African American. Uh, sister up up in Indian Orchard where you live, when her vans were were uh, were uh, damaged, uh, they went through all her vans, and I tried to get folks to focus on that, to uh, to at least investigate it, and maybe it wasn't a hate crime, but maybe it was, and I was unable to get folks to to uh, to look at that. It was a guardian of, of meals, the lady that runs the van service up there. Right. Has a tremendous van service. And uh, so we're going to file. So I got, uh, which uh, Rep. Nugent filed the last, because she was really filing on behalf of the Asian community. And I said, well, hey, the black community just is, just is victimized, and the Asians are victimized. And, 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 and but, well, here in Massachusetts and nationally, um, African Americans are the majority of all hate crimes are the victims in the majority of all hate crimes that that's the statistic they don't want to talk about even when they passed the um the hate crimes law last year that was specifically targeted at a, um, asian americans and pacific islanders the hate crime stats the fbi stats there's raised by 150 new hate crimes within one year in that same year the hate reported hate crimes nationally against African Americans was raised by over a thousand. Yet they passed the law for um, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. When it comes to hate crimes, we're still at the top of the list. Yeah, we are at the top of the list, man. And uh, and the funny thing, because I know uh, then Attorney General Healy, <coughs> she had filed um, a hate crime. But what happened? is uh it's always supposed by law enforcement you know uh but we we're simply saying bishop and you're absolutely right hey investigate it so we're, we're trying to lower the bar for investigating hate crime the bar is so high that uh they'll just say it's not a hate crime they won't even investigate it and you and i know that the majority of hate crime on black people is just disproportionate to the to the population of black people in Massachusetts and in America. Well, we definitely need to collaborate on this legislation because part of the task of, and you know this, that the um, hate crimes task force prior to last year um, was just an executive order of the governor, but the legislature um, passed a law uh, that embeds it into. Um, the fabric of Massachusetts. So, and part of the task of it is to recommend legislation. Um, and so we probably ought to sign off on that legislation, or at least a number of folks on the task force need to, um, you know, endorse that legislation uh, to make sure that it, it goes through. What, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, send, I'll have my uh, staff send a copy to, uh, to, to you and to the, to the uh, folks. Uh, on the team uh, where you are and, and hopefully you folks will sign up because we need it and and the more the more the better but what happened is that folks uh some of the leadership uh, just had death heirs just death heirs to hate crime i mean uh, i'm not saying everything's a hate crime i'm not saying that but i'm saying there's a lot of it is a hate crime and if you don't investigate it then how do you know it's not a hate crime they don't want to take the resources to investigate it that's real. So we'll be collaborating on that one. That's, a, that's another one. And then the other one, and then uh, we can talk about other current events, is the one I I, uh, I passed. I didn't pass. I, 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 uh, I uh, filed the legislation. Enact relative 
to expungement of certain past marijuana convictions. What I'm simply saying is that the governor, then Baker, and, and Governor-elect Healy wanted to say, okay, we'll give you a pardon. We'll, we'll, we'll give you a pardon on, on, your, on, your, on your marijuana. Yeah, but then it stays on their record. Now you got it. <laughs> and then, they, then, then they're still restricted in all other areas, and all you know the the the, the craziness about this. Uh, and there's another caller. I'm gonna get to you in a minute, caller. There's, the craziness about this is, you know, I think about Michael Thompson in Michigan. Um, he had three pounds of marijuana. They sentenced him to forty to sixty years in prison. He spent 25 years in prison. His mama died. His daddy died. His brother died. All while he was in prison. Then uh, marijuana became legal in Michigan. And the, the prosecutor, the, the, the law enforcement officer that arrested him, the prosecutor that prosecuted him, and the judge that sentenced him all retired. And all of them went into the cannabis industry and are making millions of dollars off the cannabis industry. So how in the world is this was this man still rotting in prison while the people who put him in prison were now making money from selling weed? It, it, it's insane. Right. But uh, so, so this, so <clears throat> what this, what my bill does, it says if you had a possession of marijuana, and I'm not talking about uh, possession with intent to sell, I'm not talking about uh, uh, the, 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 the side cases that go along with it because they'll say, well, they're charging him with possession of marijuana, then, they got, then he had an assault and battery. Then he had a disturbing the peace. We're simply saying that if you had a possession of marijuana, I don't want the burden on the citizens to go. You have to, you, you, right now, you can, you, can, um, you can petition the court, you can petition the state, to say, hey, I want my marijuana, but you got to go down to the courthouse. You got to file a paperwork, and then let me tell you what happens now. This is. it should be expunged. So, in other words, the probation department should automatically, if you had a possession of marijuana, automatically expunge it, not seal it, expunge it, which means erase it off of your record. It's not illegal anymore. But what they want to do, if you, if they say, all right, you got to go to the to the, uh, we'll give you a pardon. That simply means now you got to go to where? A pardon doesn't. You got to go now to the governor's council. Then the governor, governor's council, has to look at your case. Now let me tell you something. They're going to look at that marijuana case, and they can look at every other case on your record. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, they're going to decide not to deal with expunge your record and and, and keep it on there. Exactly. So it's it, and I'm going to close with this. Mir a, pos a, a possession of marijuana, a certain amount in Massachusetts, is not illegal anymore. So let's clean up all these people. And this goes back 30, 40 years. People still have things on their record. Let's expunge it. you got a possession of marijuana. This, this film, it's got, a lot of, it's got a lot of traction. Folks understand. we gotta, we got to make the process fair. It's just not a fair process. And folks are not going to go downtown to the probation department. Now you got to go to the governor's council. You got to go to the parole board. All these people, somebody in there is going to say no. And you picked it up. Absolutely. Appreciate your time, and I will talk to you next week. All right. Thank you, Rep. 413-736-2781. That was State Representative Ben Swan with our State House update. Uh, all of the things that are happening here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, so please bear those things in mind. Those of you who were trying to get in uh, on the telephone, um, hit me up, 413-736-2781. We'll take your request in the Twitter space. Good morning, caller. Hey, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out, is, uh, what about the ones that have been deported? Are they allowed to come back now? Turn down, turn down your radio. There's some feedback. I said, I wonder what happened to the guys that got deported back from Massachusetts by the United States back to their own country. Do they come back now? Are they able to come back? Yeah, I, I can't answer that. See, every state is different in terms of how it's dealing. Um, with, with marijuana, you know, those that have legalized it, there are some states that are being progressive and saying, yes, we're going to uh, expunge the records of those 
that were convicted. We're going to we're going to reverse some things, uh, and then other states are being very slow um, to move on it, and uh, hence that's why it's important. The legislation Representative Williams was just talking about um, is that it's crazy because right here in Massachusetts it's legal now. There's a there's a cannabis store popping up on every corner, and there are and here's the crazy thing. Whereas it was black folk who were being locked up, you know, and mass incarcerated over weed, it's white folks that are making millions of dollars off of selling weed now. While 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 those same black people um, have that on their record and find it difficult to find jobs and make a living because of it. That matter of fact, here, here here's the crazy thing: somebody with a weed conviction can't even get a job at the cannabis store. Because of their weed conviction. That's crazy. Yeah, so... They're legalized now, so they can do that. Right. But I was, just, I was wondering what about the ones that have been deported, like back to Jamaica, the Virgin Islands, or something. But yeah, yeah. A good question. I don't have the answer, but that's a good question. Appreciate you, brother. All right. Have a nice day. 413 2781 these are the kinds of so when we talk about erasing black history, this is the kind of stuff they don't want to talk about. They don't want to talk about the disparity in how drug possessions and drug offenses were dealt with. They don't want to talk about how um, zero tolerance for drugs during the 80s and the 90s, especially after the 94 crime bill, um, crack versus cocaine uh, they don't want to talk about how black people were mass incarcerated over drugs and then when white folks got hooked off of prescription opioids and then they graduated from the prescription opioids to heroin um, they all of a sudden had a kinder gentler approach to drug possession, drug use, drug addiction. All of a sudden, it became a national um, um, public health crisis, as if drug addiction shouldn't have been a public health crisis prior to white folks getting addicted. But since the majority of the people that were getting hooked on opioids were white, they had a different approach. Um, even before they started passing certain laws, we had cities and towns here in Massachusetts that if they found these white folks with with illegal opioids, heroin, so on, they wouldn't even take them to jail. They would take them straight to detox. All right, they wouldn't arrest them. Um, um, you know, the, the, the presidents of the United States, um, um, Barack Obama and Donald Trump, um, talked about this great public health crisis and how they needed to help people who were addicted to opioids. They sued the companies that made Oxycontin and Oxycodone and they paid billions of dollars to white families whose, whose family members got hooked on opioids. They never paid black folks a dime even after it was proven that the government helped flood crack cocaine into black neighborhoods. How, how Ronald Reagan, while his wife was running around talking about just say no to drugs, him and Oliver North were in cahoots uh, around the Iran-Contra uh, situation uh, with flooding drugs into the black community and then taking money that was made off the sale of crack to help fund the Iran Contra. This is what they did to black people, but then all of a sudden when white folks got hooked, it was let's let's be kind and gentle and let's give them help and let's give them medical attention and, and, and all of that. That's a part of American history, but they don't want y'all to talk about that because that makes them feel anguish. That makes them feel guilty. They feel extreme pain when they have to hear about how uh, Joe Biden's crime bill, Ronald Reagan flooding drugs and all that stuff, uh, literally decimated black families and black neighborhoods. They don't want to hear about that. That makes them feel guilt and anguish. So we're going to abolish that conversation. We're not going to talk about that. 
Good morning, caller. Good morning, Bishop. Oh, how are you? I'm good. You? Good. I, I, I just wanted to ask the startup cost to open up cannabis stores. And I heard you can't get a loan from the bank. You either have to have investors or grants. So it's really out of reach especially for minorities, don't you? Yeah, it's, it's out of reach, but then there are some who have the investors, have the capital, who are being denied licenses. So you got to remember, there's a process by which you get a license to open a cannabis store, and, and those that are black and other non-whites who are applying get approved at a far less clip than white investors who apply for for cannabis licenses. So you still are gonna gonna have that disparity um, that the same folk who locked us up for selling drugs or smoking drugs are gonna be the ones that get the license to sell the drugs <laughs> that you can smoke again legally. And, and uh, how come the bank don't want to touch it? The, the banks don't want to give you financing. I'm not sure. Um, uh, you know, perhaps they see it as a risk, um, a risky investment. Uh, I, I, I really can't answer that because I really haven't done the research on, um, on on the bank rolling of these particular campaigns. Okay, Bishop. Thank you. All right. Appreciate you. 413-736-2781. Let me get... Okay, M1, we're going to try to get you in again. Let's see if... Let's see if you're audio problem has been solved see if we can get you in the twitter space m1 come with it all right looks like you still got some problems bro i don't know what you need to do maybe you need to get a new computer i uh, get you a macbook man once you go mac you never go back i don't know i don't know if you're on your phone or, or what's happening with you bro uh but you're having some trouble good morning caller you're on the air Oh, yeah, so I was just calling about the um, federal, why the bank can't back the marijuana. All right. It's, beca it's because they're they're backed by the federal government, and it's still illegal on the federal side. Gotcha, gotcha. The bank can't, yeah, because it's still illegal on the federal side. It's state by state, it's legal, but on the federal, you can't. That's why you can't file it on your taxes, because it's still illegal. Gotcha, it makes perfect sense. Appreciate that insight. No problem. Liberty Tax is calling. That's who it is. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Now. 413-736-271. Good information, uh, and it makes perfect sense. Yes, because FDIC, all that stuff, uh, the, the banks are federally um, backed, and so um, it makes perfect sense that they would not allow them to fund um, the cannabis uh, industry. Um M1, I don't know if I'm going to keep trying to get you on, man, because um, you obviously have some issues going on um, with your with your stuff. So, holler at me. You know, what's going on? What's happening? What's, what, 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 what's good? Okay. Um, see, I tried to get you on again. Anyway, 413-736-2781. If you're in the Twitter space, uh, put your request in. A um, couple more minutes left in the program. Uh, remember to check me out on Monday. I'll be back uh, uh, on the spoken word on Monday morning at 9 o'clock. You don't want to miss it. Next Thursday, the 16th of February, Dr. Keith Motley will be the first speaker for the 13th annual Lift Every Voice Lecture Series. The week after that, um, Dr. Wes Bellamy, uh, educator, politician, he was the vice mayor of Charlottesville uh, when the white supremacists went through there when Donald Trump was president, screaming Jews will not replace us and all kinds of other foolishness. Um, uh, he's going to be my guest. Uh, and then get get ready for March. Teslin Figaro is going to be talking about uh, push the line politics until something happens. And then Springfield's own Vicki Irvin is coming back home uh, in April. And you don't want to miss that. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. 
Uh, hello, uh, my name is Francis Cruz, but I, I wanted to ask you a question. This, I don't know if you know, but uh, I own a kitchen. How you get in touch with them? I've been trying to get them people all this year. They ain't got them here. <laughs> I appreciate you, sis. They they got this thing called the White Pages. Um, you know, you can go, go to whitepages.com. I, I don't know if you can still call 411 from your telephone or not, if that still works. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> that's the best I can tell you. Unfortunately, you know, I don't, I have not, um, I have not put it to memory the the contact information for all the businesses in Springfield. Um, and I'm not a partner in Iona's Kitchen or anything like that, so I don't know if I can help you with that other than to tell you that uh, Google is your friend. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I love y'all. I really do. <laughs> I got to get out the way. Um, Big D is in the studio. She's coming up next uh, with Mid Morning Jazz. Uh, great black music happening right here on WTCC. So don't you touch the dial. Don't you go nowhere. Um, good music is still coming. Once again, check me out on Monday. We'll be back. New topic, uh, new show um, leading into the lecture series. It's all happening on Monday morning. I got to get out your way. If you're looking for a place to worship, check us out at Spring of Hope Church of God in Christ, 35 Alder Street, Springfield, Massachusetts, 11 o'clock a.m. on Sunday morning. Again, happy anniversary to my wifey, 32 years, y'all. It's been a long, long time, and we're celebrating this weekend. Um, look, love y'all. See y'all. I'm out of here until the next time I talk to you and you talk to me. Always remember, God loves you. So do I. Peace and blessings. Good, how you feel? <laughs> <laughs>